look who's in the house. Look who's here. Yes, I'm so excited. Harold Davis said yes. Thank you so much, Harold, for coming into the Macro Chat Live show. Thank you for asking me, Janice. Oh, and I see, I, you know, we were chatting a little bit before and you are so welcome. Are you kidding me? I'm so excited. I was telling him all the stuff that uh, I'm excited about, but we have tons of things to talk about. So I'm going to really talk fast. If you are newbies, this is the Macro Chat Live show. We talk about macro, micro, and close-up photography. And once a month, I have an amazing photographer like Harold come in and chat about him, his whole story, what he does. You're going to have a blast today, I'm telling you. We will uh, talk, dive in really, really deep. We're going to do a real quick promo, and then we're going to go right into Harold because I have so much to share with you guys, and he's going to chat it up. All right, let's go, AD. Today's Macro Photography Live Chat Show is brought to you by Adventurers of the F-Stop, a $29 monthly membership to elevate your macro and landscape photography and business skills. Just go to membership.sullivanjphotography.com and check out all the details to push your creations in 2018. I'm back. Hey, I just told Harold they're all chatting it up. Thank you so much. So Pat's here. Lynn's here. Catherine's here. Becky's here. Eugene's here. I know, I know Tony's supposed to be here. So thank you so much, you guys, for being here. And you know that you can um, chat it up. And then also, if you have questions for Harold, then um, definitely ask them. And myself will try to ping them, or you know, AD will too. So I. Harold, you are so prolific. Oh my gosh, you guys, we will be sharing his beautiful work, but his website, wait till you see it. He has written tons of books, bestsellers, online courses, workshop events. He has a, a, a frequently asked questions on his website. You guys could go there. His portfolios are absolutely amazing. And I highly recommend you taking time and read his artist statement. Just unbelievable. And I really do love your old to new. It's really, really cool. And he has scholarships. So Harold, again, thank you so much. I, I just, how do you find time to do all this? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they say, if you want to get something done, ask somebody busy. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you, you have so much. And so I wanted to tell everybody out in the chat, if you say you do not have time for photography and your passion, you need to always go to Harold's well, website, which AD has put down over on his side. So his website's over on the side. And after the show, I will definitely have all his information and anything that he chats about, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and put that down. So the first thing that I always love to hear is your story. I really want to know, I mean, how you got into where you're at at the moment. It would be great to know more about you. Well, Janet, it, it, truthfully, it was a long and winding road. It's a complex story, and I'm, I'm happy to share some of it, but please feel free to stop me if you have questions <laughs> okay. about it. Uh, the, uh, um, I mean, the thing is that I don't think people become artists in a straight and narrow path. It just doesn't happen. And you take a lot of life experience and nothing is wasted. So I, I my, my parents gave me a old box camera when I was maybe five or six years old. And I really love taking pictures. Photography was one of the things that I really did. Um, the, in, in high school, I was involved with the yearbook as a photographer. And I think that was partly because the cool kids hang out at, hung out in the dark room and I wanted to be a cool kid. But, <laughs> but, That's awesome. <laughs> but I, I also love the magic. You know, there was a yeah. magic about developing something and watching it come out in the developer. It's just an incredible feeling. Uh, these days for me, the light box work is somewhat like that because it's kind of magic. And so are the x-rays that I've been doing because you don't know what you're going to get till it starts developing and that's that for me that's that's really part of it you know I was a I thought I wanted to be a fine art painter I had a fair amount of background as a painter when I eventually and eventually is a good word graduated from college um, I my degree was in computer science and math so my <laughs> first my first jobs were as a programmer eventually and again there's an eventually I went through law school and got a law degree 
Oh, uh, wow. I did not know that part. I knew about the other part, but I didn't know about the law degree. Oh, wow. So I kind of, uh, I kind of hated it actually, but, <laughs> but I did it. You know, I, I have four wonderful kids and I, I half joking, I say, don't grow up to be accountants or lawyers, please. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let your kids grow up to be cowboys. But <laughs> anyhow, I, I graduated from uh, law school and hung up my shingle on a studio at 18th Street and Broadway in Manhattan. So I call that uh, photography 1.0 for me because it was my first photography career. I did all kinds of things. I had an assignment from a real estate company to fly in a helicopter over the World Trade Towers. I uh, crossed the northernmost range of mountains in Alaska. I had, I had uh, solo museum shows and so on and so forth. I had a pretty successful career. At a certain point, uh, uh, there started to be publishing of fine art posters of my work, particularly related to the shows. And mm -hmm. I discovered that I could publish them myself. So I started a publishing company called Wilderness Studio, which published note cards and posters. And um, two things came from this. First, there was no adequate piece of software that let me run the inventory management and sales part of this, so I wrote the software. Oh, that's awesome. Secondly, uh, a lot of artists came to me and said, how do you do it? How do you, how do you publish your work as, as cards? So, that, so I wrote an article about how to do that because I got tired of answering the same questions over and over again. And a book publisher saw it and that became my first book. It was in print and for about 25 years, went through several editions. It was called Publishing Your Art as Cards, Posters and Calendars. And about this time, I met my uh, my wife, actually my second wife, Phyllis. And at the time I met her, she was a practicing professional bassoonist in Manhattan. And after a while, we said uh, 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 we said to each other, "Well, what are we doing here in Manhattan?" So we moved to a farm in Vermont. Oh, wow. and I also found I could make much more money uh, writing software than I could as a photographer. It was really easy. I worked for Fortune 50 companies, banks, investment yeah. companies, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wrote a lot of books about things that had nothing to do with photography, um, it, it, which it, it goes under the nothing is ever wasted. Yeah, and, but you were writing, so writing is an amazing skill in itself, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I, I think it's also bound very closely with photography, incidentally. I mean, my, part of my my art is that I write about it, and that helps yes. clarify for me what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. I would say that, and I'll, let me get back to my life story in a minute, but I would okay. say that my blog on my website, I've been writing it since 2005, 10 to 20 stories a month. That that adds up to thousands of photos and thousands of stories. Many of them are technical. So this is kind of my day book. It's in, in the way Ed, Edward Weston had a day book. It's my yes. thoughts about what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, how I'm doing it. Sometimes it's not about that at all. Sometimes it's about my family or just saying I'm happy or I'm sad. But a lot of the time it is about what I'm photographing, why, what my inspiration is. And if I couldn't write, I'd feel much poorer about things. I mean, uh, a quote from Ansel Adams, who has a quote for everything photographic uh, and, and all seasons, is that the most important piece of tool he had in his his backpack was always a pencil and a and a writing pad. Yes. So so yes. I really do believe in it. In any case, I wasn't photographing anything except my kids. I, we moved to California. We moved to Berkeley, California. I got a high tech company to move us out, and I was still writing books. I wrote two books about how Google operates, among other things, as well as programming titles. Mm -hmm. Along about 2004, one of the publishers, one of the major publishers I, I wrote for, said, Harold, we hear digital photography is up and coming. Can you write a book for us about it? So I went out to Best Buy and bought a Nikon DSLR and wrote them the book. Oh, and that is so amazing. What a story. I, that is so cool. So what, what turned out is that I liked 
the new digital photography more than I'd ever liked the old photography. Now, not everyone feels that way. And yeah, but this is some, about you. It's yeah. about me. But, you know, well, it's something I talk, I talk about with people quite a bit. Yeah. Because, you know, of course, there are some consummately wonderful artists of uh, in analog photography, Edward Weston, Ansel Adams, Jerry Ilsman, Andre Cortez, Henry Cartier-Bresson, just to name a few. Mm. And... Uh, but for me, this this was something I really could do. It combined my interest in actually in, in painting and in software and in photography. So I didn't look back. Uh, I, I had to kind of convince the uh, publishers I worked with. My agent had to convince them that, hey, this guy really does know something about photography. He's not just a, a technical wannabe. <laughs> but I did, and I started getting assignments, and I started licensing work, and oh, about 2008, I think, uh, I started doing workshops for the first time. My first workshops were with uh, Point Reyes uh, Field uh, Workshops, which is the NGO associated with Point Reyes National Seashore, and that was great. It was a great learning place, a great place to practice, and I, I think I worked with them for about six or seven years, and at a certain point, I, it was Phyllis's idea who said, okay, uh, now we need to do some of this on our own. So, yeah, no, that's good, yeah. So we have our own workshop organization. I still work with other uh, organizations as well for that kind of thing. I'm doing a garden photography week with main media workshops coming up in the middle of next month. I've done that for a few years running, and it's always a total blast because I get access to gardens of well-to-do people that I would never have access to otherwise. Right, uh, right. What a, what a bonus on that, too, because some of these... Flowers that now do you get is that with the flowers that we're going to be seeing soon is that what is that where you get to you know I mean your work is gorgeous but do you get to is that where you go shoot it or when you, or you just take it on well, your own well well I'm not uh, Janice I'm not picky when it comes to flowers <laughs> I love them all uh, that's awesome but, okay but but for, but a couple of extremes there one is there are a couple of local really high end gardens one's the uh, landscape practice garden of the uh, architecture program at UC Berkeley that let me use flowers there but i also grow most of my own so most of the th the work you see or much of it at any rate is flowers grown in my garden in berkeley we have an 11 month growing season it's almost nothing. There's no time of year that something beautiful isn't growing here. And, you know, at the other end of the thing, if I need a lot of flowers for, let's say, for my uh, photographing flowers for transparency workshop, I will go to Trader Joe's and buy out the store. That's you know, awesome. there's, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. Those are, yeah. those are great flowers. Yeah, that's great. You know, what we'll do now. We'll go ahead and we'll share. Let me share Lightroom first. What I was going to do is go to Lightroom and we will look at your images as you talk. Now, I don't know how you want to do this. Do you want to talk about the shooting, how you go about shooting and then pros post process Janice, second? Janice, let, 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 let's, let's vary depending upon the image. I think the most, this, this one I call Kiss from a Rose. And I think the single most interesting thing about this for me is that if you Google Georgia O'Keeffe Rose, you will find this image. Oh, it looks so, like a, it looks like her. Yeah, so, her painting. You know, so for, for me, I'm pretty flattered by that. Of oh, course. yeah. Great, she is a great artist and great painter, but still, don't believe everything you see in Google and don't believe attributes. <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty funny. And in fact, there was a situation that came up uh, not so long ago where there was a sort of pseudo-biography of O'Keefe with all kinds of... Uh, naughty details in it and the, <laughs> the estate would not let her use a would not let the publisher use one of her actual photos for the cover so they licensed this one from me oh that's awesome very very cool so now are these kind of the same things then is this um how are you are see uh these two seem kind of similar and this one kind of so are these explain how you do your thought process on shooting these and then i'll go to a couple different other yeah, uh, no, I, I think you're absolutely right that the first two were basically photographed the same way, um, which, and this is a little bit different be because 
uh, let, let's go back to the rows for a second. So, oh, let's go to the rows? Okay. Yeah, go back to the rows. So if you look okay. at the rows on the next one, which is a camellia, both of these were photographed in available light using a telephoto macro lens and with uh, usually with somewhere between five and ten exposures each that were combined in post-production. So that's, oh. a, that's a pretty typical process for me. Mm -hmm. the, the one, the next one that you showed, the anemone, is something where I backlit the, the flower to get the light there. You see it on the left there. Yeah. So to, to get yeah. the light coming through the center behind the flower core. But it's also a, a combination of many exposures. So post-production is a really important part of it for me. Mm -hmm. What I, at the same time, you know, anything you can do in the camera is going to be less trouble than post-production. So I totally believe in working in the camera first. And what is also the case is that composition is the single most important thing. Now, when you're doing floral photography, what that means is you have to learn how to do flower arrangement. You have to mm -hmm. learn what's important in a flower, what isn't, how you make interesting patterns out of, out of flower cores and flower centers. And, um, uh, Wow, what a fun thing to do. Oh yeah, for sure. I okay. So I mean there's so much here that let me let me here's another flower. We'll just keep on that for just a second. This is a beautiful composition. It's so now did is this just one uh it's so sharp. I yeah, mean this, it's this one this one is a single exposure, in fact. And wow. and I looked at it and for me it's sort of like the petals of this um I'm not, this daisy is what it was. It's a ger gerbera daisy. The, mm -hmm. the petals here are like almost looking up at a canyon. So sometimes I like to, in macro and close-up work, think that what I'm dealing with is a kind of landscape in a small scale. And that's what this image does for me. Yeah, there, for sure. There was nothing special in post-production here. So for me, the range is that, hey, something like this, you know, you take it, maybe you sharpen it a little or a little bit or and adjust things, maybe 1% and that's it uh, at the one end. At the other end, something like the kiss from a rose image, it might take me a week to get that right. To and, get it done. See, yeah. that's good to know. Yeah. See you guys. Yeah, this is good. So here's a, here's another one that's just gorgeous. How'd you do, how'd you do this one? This one is beautiful. This it is, has a lot, the lighting and the, oh, it's just beautiful. This is a dahlia. Yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, it's on a piece of black velvet photographed in the mm. studio with selective lighting from both sides using, a, using a macro LED lights. And then again, a multiple exposures to, so that I could control what parts were light and what parts weren't. Perfect. So it's kind of like, it's, it's like an HDR type thing. Okay. It so is. it is, it's an, an exactly what it is, but it's a natural HDR. This is a, a kind of HDR that I and some other people have called hand HDR because I don't put it through an automatic blender. I actually mask in the parts that I want and control it that way. Got it. Yes. Yes. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yes. That's a great, um, see, I, that, would be so much fun to reveal, kind of like the dark room, huh? <laughs> kind, of like the, kind of like the dark room. <laughs> now these are these are absolutely, uh, these are absolutely my favorite, and I have to just, I just can't wait to just talk to you, just help everybody what you're up to, and we will show more of these for sure. But uh, these are this great. Is this is, these are a couple of stems of campanulas, which are commonly called Canterbury bells. And they were placed on an x-ray machine. And there's some post-production involved in this, but this is the kind of medical x-ray machine that people go in to get their legs or feet uh, x-rayed. The flowers were placed there. In some respects, the process of making this kind of image is a little bit like uh, making a photogram used to be, where you would lay uh, the subject, the flower, for example, on a, on a piece of film, expose it that way, and let the sun do the part of it that was going to be exposed. With the x-ray machine, you dial basically dial in the power, and depending on the subject, it goes through. So it reveals parts of the image that you wouldn't otherwise see. In terms of post-production, what happens is that a medical file is created out of this. It's called a DICOM file, it's, and that's a format used in the medical x-ray world. If you go in for May, you never have to have a, a DICOM file made of oneself personally, but if you do, it's a, they give you the DICOM file, and you can open that up in Photoshop and start to work with it. Oh, 
okay, got it. We do have a question from Lynn. Yeah, thank you, AD. We have a question from Lynn. She said, how do you get the black background? And I'm I'm assuming that she's probably talking about something like this or uh, the last image was, yeah. The, dal the dahlia, I think, is what oh, okay. she's referring to. And again, I photographed that on black velvet. That's how I got the black background. Yeah, yeah. So that's so Some how of my images on black, and I'm sure you'll show some of them, are inversions of what's called the lightness channel in, in LAB color. Interestingly, with something like this image, this is what's called a fusion x-ray and I say what's called I'm giving myself the ability to name things because <laughs> a process, why not and why not it's a process that uh, my collaborator Dr. Julian Kopfka who's a radiologist and a physicist and I invented what we what we do is we photograph the subject on we we create a piece of plexiglass that works as a template we photograph we put the subject on the template and then in synchronization we create a light box image and an x-ray image. So these are tulips that have been uh, photographed on a light box and then also exposed on an x-ray and the two are combined in post-production. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's how you got the color in. Yes. Basically. Oh, that's just absolutely gorgeous. Oh my gosh, I hope you keep going with this. This is so cool. Well, I intend to, but I have to tell you that the, that acts, that Obviously, there are some hazards involved with x-rays, number one. And number two, the gear is not cheap. It's about a quarter of a million dollars for a Ooh. thing. It's probably the single most expensive camera I've ever used. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I guess so. Wow. That's just crazy. But, oh, wow. This is so pretty. Now, is this one also type that type of thing? Is this what yes, is Exactly. This is another uh, Fusion x-ray. Wow. Now, everybody, listen, he's doing this from x-rays. It's not like he drew this. In, it's just it's just crazy to me. I mean, that just totally caught my eyes. And when I saw x-ray, I was like, wow, this is just it's so beautiful. And we were, and you were talking about, you know, having your technical side and your artistic side so you must be really ecstatic when you pull these and play with them and stuff these, like these that. These are a, these are a total blast and they're also from a point of view of uh, of somebody who cares about making a living which with four kids coming into college I do they've proved to be uh, pretty uh, successful in that one of the companies that makes the x-ray equipment uh, licensed a calendar for uh, 2019 made up of these images and there's some prospect of a major exhibit of them coming up soon. There's a lot of interest in them. Oh yeah, great, great. Oh yeah, if there, that's, I, there's gotta be, <laughs> come on, you know, there's, so let's go to the, let's go to, to what I think most people know you from and this, oh, there's another question. Oh, it's x-ray, okay, so, uh, Harold, do you wear a densometer when you do your x-ray photography? Are you exposing yourself to radiation during the filming? I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. No, <laughs> what, what I've done so far is I go where the operator of the machinery goes. When, uh, a lot of these were done on, on what are used during the daylight hours for mammography. So their x-rays of human breasts are normally done on these platforms. And mm -hmm. What in the place where I did them, what ha the operator does is goes behind leaded glass. So, and so that's that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that was a good question, and he is safe, so he can take care of his children. Now, oh wait, the, why is this so big? Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how that happened. Now, is this also? No, that that's that's a conventional photo, more or less. If, okay. anything, if anything I ever do could be called conventional, <laughs> just open it out. But the, the, this was photographed on a light box on a white background. It's a weed plucked from the middle of the street. And um, I, I inverted, as it's called, the background from white to black and actually the weed itself also from black to white. So this is a conventional photograph with some post-production manipulation. Right, that's beautiful. And okay. it happens to be the cover of my new book, which is coming out next oh. month. Oh, good, good. We got to we got to talk about that too. In the end of the show, that's where I'd like to really hone in on what you're up to. What you know, your 
you know, whatever you're up to for sure, we'll book the book and everything else. So then that's, you know, they'll, I want them to remember that. So let's go. Now, this is also the same as the uh, white, the box. Is that what that, this is? That, that is correct. That is a light box image photographed on a white uh, background with backlighting inverted with the white turned to black. As opposed to the one of the of the weed, though, the colors here are essentially what the colors of the mallows and poppies shown in this image were. So it's, it's a little bit, uh, I'm trying for a little bit of a different effect in the two images. Now, I read somewhere that you put them in water. Is that correct? You put them in water. Is that how you flatten them or something? Or did I read something? <laughs> no, you read correctly, but but, okay. it, but but it would go sometimes. I oh. mean, they, okay, and there are two different water issues. One mm -hmm. is that uh, I get often get asked this, particularly in the Photographing Flowers for Transparency workshop, how do you open up flowers, get them to lie flat? And, you know, I, I say, well, you play Mozart for them and you talk to them gently. But <laughs> if you also rub the petals softly with warm water, that helps them open and stay open, too. Uh -huh. The other thing is that there's an interesting question. If you have a blossom that is three dimensional at the bottom, so it, so it has like seeds coming out of it. How do you get it to stay flat when you photograph it? One of the ways I found to do that is to put it in a tray of water so that it's floating in the water. And then the fact that there's like a submarine iceberg underneath part of the thing doesn't matter. It's still floating upright. Oh, interesting. Okay, that's great. Let's see this one. This is another one, but it's just kind of the, the light side yeah, could, of it. Can you flip, flip back to the last one for a sure. second? Sure. Let let me get. So it. if you look at some, if you look at something like the one on white, I can easily turn it to have a black background, and it becomes more something like this. So I like to say that that's getting a two for two for the price. <laughs> My husband would like that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and this is beautiful. And you bring these back in. Uh, so when so let's talk about your shooting it or your you know, you're shooting it. Do you plan it all out or just comes with the flow and then, you know, and then you shoot it and then post processing? How do you how do you go about doing your stuff? That's a great question, Janice, and there's no easy answer. Uh, I mean, I was going to be really glib and say yes, yes to <laughs> yes to all of it. <laughs> it just depends. First of all, there, uh -huh. you know, occasionally I am shooting to specifications, mm -hmm. and in that case, obviously, I plan things out. That's that's rare for me, though. Mostly, I'm pleasing myself, and. Sometimes I have a pretty good idea of where I'm going and everything's pretty planned. Sometimes I'm just fooling around and having fun and playing. I like to put on music and just see where things go. Um, I, I, what I really am a believer in is starting with a plan, but being open to things changing. So, uh, you know, and I, I sort of liken that to if you were a medieval knight going on a quest, you'd have the quest. It's a goal. Great. And then as you're on your quest, something comes along. A boar is chasing a beautiful maiden and you have to rescue her or him or whatever. And uh, so you do something else and you change your mind. A lot of the time, what I'll do when I have a program and a first idea of what I'm doing is work to get that done, then use the material there to, me to do other things as well, to just play around and see what happens. Because, you know, in this particular uh, photograph, for example, all the flowers are from my garden. These are tulips, a clematis, iris, and a couple of other things in there. But it's a lot of flowers. It's a lot of material. And, you know, I we always hurt the ones we love. Well, maybe not, but I feel bad for the flowers, so I want to get as much use out of them as I can. Yeah, you know they're going to go away. Yeah. So you're bringing them to life. And then another thing, too, is, you know, you're, you're really good at um, positioning so it's not so busy where you're like oh that's not too much I mean you just you just get sucked into the flowers so you really you you really pull us in and that's well, well composition is really important and, yes you know I think I think for, per, perhaps my background in painting and art history has really helped me most with that but you know and I would suggest to people who are interested that you look at the work of great painters as well as photographers to understand composition a bit better. But every photograph tells a story and you need to understand what the story is and you need to understand that a photograph that's gonna work for your audience, they're not looking at it saying, 
what the heck is this? How did he do it? If they say that, well, maybe you haven't done something quite right. And I know that people will say that about my images sometimes, and sometimes I don't do everything right. But that said, you want something that makes some kind of cohesive sense. There's a structure that mimics the real world, that presents a narrative that people can buy into. If you were writing fiction, you would call the suspension of disbelief. You have to make things that will let people suspend disbelief. Right, right. And this this is what I like, too. So this is this for me is, um, you know, uh, I think you have a whole portfolio on this, too. I do. And I, I just did a whole other I won't say portfolio, but if I really process the ball, a whole other like about 100 images yesterday with the same kind of ideas. Oh, I just love this. It's just so graceful. Oh, more questions. Let's see. Um, are you still printing your own books and what type of paper and binding are you using these days? I know that you are making some, you, you uh, so who said that was Stacy? But Stacy, you need to check out his printing area because not, not so much just the books, but what I'm very excited about, cause you know, we're in that world where you're doing this all the time. And I just love how you use different papers and it, it just that's another on top of your images another feeling to your work so let's talk about that too i sure, just go I'd back to I'd, us a little bit um ad so we can chat I'd, together <laughs> i'd love i'd love to talk about that a bit um yeah. first first of all i really um don't believe you really see your work until you see it printed some way. I mean, you know, it, when I first started doing digital photos back in 2004, 2005, I said, well, you know, I'll upload it to Flickr and that'll be the end of it. Well, no. <laughs> and <laughs> for many reasons, you don't really see it until you make a print of it or until it's published somewhere or something. And then you see what you shouldn't have done, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> uh, so I, I am a total believer, if no other reason than to help one become a better photographer in making prints and printmaking. I think that's a crucial part of it. Now, the question that was asked about, do you still use handmade papers to make your books? I think sort of combine two of the kinds of publishing projects that I'm involved in. And so one thing I do is I write books that uh, that you know go hopefully onto the Amazon photography bestseller list. And these are published by, uh, major publishing companies. They're printed, uh, that they used to be printed in China. The most recent one is printed in Korea. They, you know, uh, hopefully it'll sell 10, 20, 30, 40,000 copies. So these are mass produced books. They're produced by offset lithograph. And once we send off the files, we don't have much to do with it. My wife, Phyllis, is the wonderful uh, book designer for these books. Oh, She's great. designed all my photography books. She's a, a great, um, hello, Janice. She's a I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> it's my dog. <laughs> Sorry, a, I told you it's a laid back show. <laughs> hi, dog. What's, what's the dog's name? This is Coco. So hi, my, Coco. <laughs> my, so uh, so, what, so one, of, one, of, one of the things we have in a way that's, that's, that's an artisanal activity is that when we do one of these books with a major publishing company, I do the photographs. I write the book. Phyllis has some input into the writing also, but she does the complete in-design work, generates files, and does everything at that end. So basically the publisher, I mean, no offense, we're working with a great publisher right now, Rocky Nook, that's, they're really top of the line and wonderful people. But to a considerable extent, what they really do is market the book. That's right. their, their part of it. We we don't have much to do with marketing. They don't have much to do with the actual uh, uh, creation of the book. What we are also involved in and what is important to me is artist handmade books. And that made me what your questioner, Stacy was thinking of. Yes, say. I think she was. Yes. Uh, so I've really done maybe three at this point. The most successful was Botanique, which was a uh, book of my hand printed flower work, and we do handmade binding. Some of it's Japanese style with silk hand binding. Some of it's a, a post and beam construction binding that Phyllis invented. Um, it's con constructed on our kitchen table. I'm trying to figure out if I can get put the kids to work on it. <laughs> that's sort of, get the that's family sort of, involved. <laughs> that's sort of a joke. Well, you know, my family does help me a lot, in fact. Yeah. 
My second son uh, does most of the copywriting work on my images. They they each do something really. That's awesome. And, and uh, well, you know, originally it started out as he got his cell phone in exchange for doing the copywriting. <laughs> there you got it. That, <laughs> I got a good deal. That sucked him in, but he. Just, <laughs> he I think he also learned a lot doing it. The. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, go you know, ahead. So it's so really that kind of artist handmade book is a kind of printmaking where you're creating this ensemble. One of the other ones that we did was about my walking on the Kimono Kodo pilgrimage trail, which is sacred to Shikundo Zen in Japan. So that so there was a pilgrimage uh, handmade book like that. And then one was a book of black and white uh, photos, some of my the ones I like best that I've done over the last 10 years or so. And then I so so those are really a different kind of thing because they're just about the photos. They're not about uh, technique or talking about a place or anything like that. They're a, they're an art project. Oh, that's wonderful. That's amazing. I think somebody's saying I uh, simply uh, simply amazing, Arnold. Thank, uh, Harold, thank you for sharing your art and information. Jan is saying that she appreciates you. So you get to, you know, and it's nice to know that you have the technical side on one type of book, like you're saying, but then you got that passionate other side where you're making the books. And uh, that's really, that's amazing. Now, do you sell those books or is this something... Are you we, doing we, that? We, we've sold the art books, yes, as, oh. a, as limited edition portfolios, basically. Oh. And uh, yes, been, we've been successful with all of them. We uh, The first one, the Botanique one, we did as a Kickstarter project. We pre-sold it, actually. Oh, I think, that's I, I think there were 25 of them, one through 25, and five artist proof, uh, proofs. And I oh. think we sold most of them. Oh, that's great. That is so cool. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so let me see what time it is. I think what we should do is let's go to uh, let's go to critique time. I got to get it ready, though. Let's go to critique time. And we're just going to talk about some really quick, uh, you know, you guys, what we do is we, if you want to submit images, you can submit images. Uh, through the Facebook group, or if you're not a Facebook person, that's okay. You can go to SullivanJPhotography.com. Macro Chat Live is here, and you can submit images and questions there. And it's just like a basic thing. We're not going to dive in deep. We don't bite you and chew you up and spit you out like college professors do. No, I'm just kidding. There was, <laughs> well, there was one that wasn't, um, Harold Feinstein or whatever. But anyways, so... Um, so anyways, I just want to let you guys know that it's just fun to just get a little feedback. And that's what we're going to do today. If you want to run the, the thing, AD, and we'll, I'll get that going here. Oh, it didn't go in. <laughs> he did it for me. It was, still wasn't ready. <laughs> that's hilarious. I'm, I'm always bad with this kind of stuff, I'll tell you. Okay, so what I'll do, Harold, is I'm going to read Catherine's um, information. This is the first image. And I always ask them, you know, what, how they shoot it and what's their goal for the shot. So what I'll do is for everybody else in the background, um, and then Harold and I will, will talk about her image. So uh, this one is by Catherine. Thank you so much, Catherine, because I know this is hard to, to do. Um, she said she used a 60 millimeter macro lens and an ISO of 200. Her f-stop was 2.8 at one two thousandths of a sec. I wanted to use a shallow depth of field so I could achieve a very soft look. I love flowers and I think I like a bit of softness to add some mystery. I also see flowers as delicate and, and um, a shallow depth of field contributes to this. So this, so you want to give her a little feedback on, on sure. her uh, image? Sure. sure. Hi, Catherine. Thank you for having the guts to put your image in here. Uh, I know I know it takes some. Uh, I like the way you, you controlled your depth of field so that the pet, three petals in the front are in focus. That takes, that takes more than meets the eye, and you did a very good job of it here. The 
it would have been interesting, I think, to have your camera angle a little bit higher so you could have seen more of the center core of the flower. With macro work, it's interesting that very slight variations of position produce huge changes in the image. So it's worth playing around with all kinds of places that you might be. Um, that said, you know, I think this is a really fun artistic macro image showing low depth of field and good control. If, if this kind of image interests you, you might look into playing with a more telephoto macro lens, something in the uh, 150 to 200 millimeter range, because that really does softness in the background with good bokeh and good image separation. There's also a specialty lens that Lens Baby makes, the Lens Baby Velvet 85, that mm -hmm. is really superb for this kind of thing. So if you enjoy it, you might really want to consider it. Good job, though. Thank you for sharing it. Yes, yes. I that's that's what um I don't have one of those lenses, the the lens baby ones, but I know a lot of people do. Well, yeah. well, the Lens Baby Velvet 85 isn't one of these things with a vacuum cleaner hose on it. It's a real lens. It's a metal lens with uh, optics, but it's really designed for just this kind of work to create an extremely soft, uh, uh, almost gauzy look everywhere except the focus spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I like it, too. It feels like it's lifting up, you know, and, uh, you know, I like the way it just kind of emerges like the soft look and kind of like ah <laughs> my my voice la um but i i did think i was thinking you know cuz i know her i was thinking what if you just went down a little bit and then there just a little bit of movement and then that boop now it's like lifting up to the to the sky kind of thing now i look for the feelings you know and so i thought oh i just love the color and everything but yeah so that was my little suggestion and it's a great beautiful image good job um i like it it feels it de definitely feels soft and then we will go to the next one and she is learning let's see so the next one is kathleen and kathleen i did see that you have a question so i will ask that after we do the critique let's see where is her stuff let me see okay here she is let me, i just got to get where her stuff's at now she submitted two and she says i have two versions one edited in photoshop um the other one which i ran through nick color effects i took the photo using my light table with the intention of getting a nice clean white background and being able to see through the petals and get detail i edited an acr and photoshop to fix the color and bring out some more of the details then i remembered that i had nick uh, which I hadn't used in ages, and I wanted to see if I could bring out more glow to it. I further adjusted the color effects. I'm not sure about the tones that I like best. My first edit looks a little bit too green, which I think is this one. Let me put that one on. Um, my first edit was a little bit too green. The second looks a bit yellow and pink. And when using a light table, I'm not sure how to get solid things like stems look seems to look less murky. So I think she wants some uh, advice, Harold, on how to get this area right in here, not so murky. Do, would you be able to help her with that? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best, the best thing she could do is to take my photographing flowers for transparency workshop which is a weekend workshop and I'm giving it uh, next again uh, in June of 2020 so almost a year from now it does it do, it I've been this this will be my ninth year of doing this workshop it fills up all uh, very fast it's open for registration now but it's uh, it doesn't last long. It, I, I do have some ways to deal with this, but it's not a simple thing. It involves doing uh, multiple exposures and so on. I, I admire the artist here for uh, attempting to do this. I think there is a fair amount more technical work that needs to be done, though, to really polish the image. I also am concerned about the uh, composition and framing here because, you know, it looks like it's kind of uh, hanging in space. And yeah. so one of the things you have to do with this kind of image is figure out how you're going to anchor it. What's the anchor point of the composition? Otherwise, it's sort of like 
okay, what what am I doing here? There are sometimes botanicals that you can tie off like this with a, as as a kind of illustration, maybe with fading at the edges or something that are in the middle of the, the paper. But it doesn't really quite work that way for, that well for me here. Uh, if you have done, if you had done a series of exposures here, one of the exposures of the stem, probably two or three of them, wouldn't be murky. So that's what that's how you get around that. You use the one you use the one that isn't murky fundamentally. You could also get a little less murkiness by merging the stem with itself and painting in selectively using the multiply blending mode in Photoshop. But you know these images are tricky, and for somebody uh, who, trying this out, this is really very exciting. I'd say yes. carry on, please. Yes, yes, and I I agree. And you know what, Kathleen, I'm going to put that link down below. It's in his, it's in Harold's. Uh, website but i'm still going to put it down for you and i'll also give it to you in facebook because that would if you really love this stuff i mean i would highly suggest taking his uh workshop one of the things i did think too the same as harold is the um composition i just felt like um how can i do this here because it was floating a little bit i i don't know i just felt like if it was at least floating upwards or something <laughs> you know um because i again am very uh, i'm thinking of you know it's soft down let me show you so it's soft down here in the bottom and it's kind of the petals are kind of lifting up to the red and then going off into um you know uh, into the sky or whatever i i just kind of wanted to just throw it out by different it's just a trip on how you can make little baby adjustments and change everything up. But I really, what I really like about this is truthfully like these little areas of how it, I love the, the curves of this flower. So I think it's beautiful. And yeah, so Kathleen, I, I, you know, go for it. You're going to learn so much if you take his um, workshop for sure. Kathleen says, thank you. And uh, Catherine, let me see. Okay. Let me get, let me see. Let's go back to us. Um, thank you so much, Harold, for Dennis. You know, just just yeah. one one other thing. Uh, sure. At, at the top of my blog, the top story on my blog right now is an image that is uh, basically this kind of thing. It's a single stem with stuff coming out of it, and shows one way that one might anchor it as a composition. Oh, so, okay. So if yeah. You, you hit the blog link up there. Oh, okay. We'll go to that right now. Just just there. Oh, so, look. And you could hit the image itself for it to see it larger. Okay, here you go, Kathleen. Look, look, this is the anchor. Perfect. What talk about? Wow, that's awesome. First right there. That is like made for Kathleen. Oh my gosh, that's great. Yes, yes. There's the anchor. See how he anchors it down in here and the flowing. Oh, that's just beautiful. Beautiful. And then Oh, is okay now on your. Well, I want to talk about this image real quick. I could tell it's the light box, and you did the the you know the painting in. Now in the background, did you just let it? Is is that like a texture type thing? Because I know you do yeah, talk about yeah. textures too. Well, okay, so there's a distinction between a texture and a background. A background is something you put an image on. A texture is something that goes over the image to add depth and perhaps color and some other things. My thought with this flower, this by the way is. Uh, uh, what's called an angel's trumpet. It's a Brugmansia. And an interesting point about this flower is that the it's it, it's around the world and fairly popular in many gardens, but in the wild it's extinct. And the, re oh. the reason that it's extinct, it's believed to be that there was probably an animal that carried the seeds around and the animal went extinct. So the, so this became extinct in the wild. So what you're basically getting is cuttings at this point from the existing uh, plants. In any case, the flowers are wonderful, huge, and they're also highly toxic. That's one of the oh. most poisonous decorative uh, plants out there. It, so it is placed on a piece of paper. When I say placed on a piece of paper, and again, at the workshops, the, you know, I always have to clarify this. The piece mm -hmm. of paper was scanned on a flatbed scanner, and then I combine it using a, using a formula that I'm happy to give out to people uh, mm -hmm. in post-production. I also uh, should say that I did a lynda.com LinkedIn learning course on backgrounds and textures uh, 
it's a very complete course. There's a lot in it where you get backgrounds, how you make them, how you make textures, how you combine them. And you can get a free trial membership for a month so you can go watch it. Go watch oh. it for free. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing. That's that. Thank you so much, Harold. That's yeah, because texture does give it a, a nice punch. OK, let's let's go back. Let me do I have any other questions before we go into Harold's equipment equipment time? Let's see. Uh, everybody's saying there's just love your work and thank you so much. And I think that's good. If AD, if you see anything else, just let me know. So let's go into equipment time. My little my little tidbits <laughs> it gives us a break. So this is the time where you really talk. I mean, I'm assuming that your light box is really cool, and but this is a time more of and equipment is just. We know that equipment is just a piece of what we use to make our work. So that's what I was you know, interested in, I'm, you know, every people that are watching this show, I mean, they know me, they're like, wait, that's just the tool. You got to make your work. So is there tools that are your favorite that you sure, love? Sure, 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 of course. Uh, I mean, and of course you're right that it's just the tool and what counts is what's up here in one's head and one's eye, not the tools you use. But photography's always been a discipline that's one part technology, the mm -hmm. tools and equipment. And in fact, you know, people who improvise and do new processes, which this light box process is, the x-rays are, and some other things I've done are, it's always been part of it as people who are gadgeteers and uh, so on. I, I agree completely, it's not the most important part. Currently I'm using a Nikon D850, which is a, a pretty awesome camera, I think. I, I really like it a lot. I will say that I think a tripod is perhaps the most important piece of equipment uh, a photographer can have, particularly a macro close-up photographer. I've got a number of good uh, tripods. I always tell students, buy a good one first, otherwise you'll just spend more money as you go through the not good ones. Yes. The, <laughs> yeah, the studio tripod I use is a really right stuff, carbon fiber with one of their heads. It's a good tripod. I have described myself as the Imelda Marcos of macro lenses. I've never seen a macro lens I don't want to own. Uh, <laughs> Isn't that the truth, man? I'm just like, oh gosh, I just love every Mac lens too, the variety, yeah. Interestingly, the light box work is mostly not macro work, if you look at it. So, you know, it could be called close up, but, act but actually what I use is a, a prime normal lens for it. A but the 55 millimeter Zeiss Otis 1.4 lens. So uh, in fairness, I have to say that Zeiss is a sponsor of mine, but there's a brightness and color clarity that comes through with many of their optics. It's hard to equal in any other way. Yes. Oh, really? Oh, okay, I haven't seen it yet. What does that okay. mean? What does that mean? That means that there, Technical difficulties. <laughs> okay, let's see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll just say we'll be right back. That was weird. I've never had that happen before. <laughs> Only with you, Harold. <laughs> I, I'm special. I'm so special. Thank you for that. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because they're like here, you know, I, I, we're delayed over here. So um, I'm on the I'm on my laptop. So right now they haven't seen it yet. They haven't seen the technical. We're back. Yay, we're back. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. We, that was the first time we would drop like that right towards the end. Usually if we're going to have problems, we usually have it in the beginning. But um Oh, look, it looks like they were showing us. Maybe it's because I could see. Okay, anyways, let's get back to the fun stuff. Let's go talk. Let's talk about 
you, we were talking about macro lens, but go ahead. <laughs> what, I, what I was saying beyond oh, macro lenses is that for the light box, I use a prime normal lens and almost any prime normal lens would be would be good. But what I use is the Zeiss 55 Otis 1.4 and that's a great lens. It's bright. It, you know, a lens is in some ways a photographer's paintbrush <laughs> and, it, and different lenses render differently. There's actually unique glass crystals in, in the lenses. It's, it's not like they're all the same, even the same uh, nominal uh, specifications of a lens can be quite different. So I, that, that's a lens that I use for most of the light box stuff. It's one very cool lens, very heavy, very expensive, by the way, too. Uh, yes, I've always yeah. heard about the Zeiss. When I was in college, that's the professor was saying, that's, you got to get a Zeiss. I still haven't gotten one yet, but I would love <laughs> to have one. <laughs> Well, you know, they're, they're the world's oldest optical company, um, the, and, and they really got into making really great uh, lenses. They're all manual focus prime lenses. They don't make zoom lenses. They don't do autofocus. But they and lights are really the two top optical makers of, of, in this era. There's nothing to match them. Yeah, right, right. Is there anything else before we dive into your website that you really enjoy when it comes to your goodies to make your work? Well, you know, there's close-up gear. How do, you know, a macro lens, even a one-to-one -one macro lens doesn't always get me as close as I want to be. So I use extension tubes. Okay. I use a, a bellows. I use a close-up lens on the front of it. I mean, some of the work that I do is microscopically close. And, oh, you know, yeah. that, that takes quite a bit. Yeah, I've always wanted to get that five Five to one. I'm a Canon girl. Yeah, that, they, that Canon lens sounds very cool. It's I one know. Of, <laughs> since, I'm, since I'm not a Canon person, it's one of the few macro lenses I don't own. But I've even thought of getting a Canon to Nikon adapter to use it. It does Just sound a, very cool. Yeah. It, it, a little bit the same effect can be got with a lens reversal ring because that really brings you very, very close. Yes, that's true. I've done. Yeah, we we played with the reverse lens too. It's it's so much fun, and everybody here just loves all of the close up macro and everything. So it's just and and the the images that we've seen are so beautiful. So let me get over to your website because what I want to do. Well, I want to get back, and then we'll share because I want to. Uh, okay, so we're here now. So one of the things that. I wanted to share with everybody is, you know, here is where the workshops Kathleen is and you click on here, you get workshops and then also, you know, you know, scholarship programs, check that out. Janice, oh, why, don't, why don't you actually show the workshops page? Sure, sure. Let's, let's go to the. No, 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 go back, go back up. Just click right there. Okay. Got it. Yeah, so oh, this this I, I I try to keep this current, and what it has it doesn't have all the uh, events and things that I'm going to be involved in in the coming year. There are a couple of really exciting ones that haven't gone public yet, but mostly as things do go public, I include them along with registration links here. So oh, this okay. this would be the spot to look, and you can see it goes through uh, spring of 2021 at this. Yes, point. yes, I see this one right here. So this yeah. is the one that she wants. Yes. And this sounds like so much fun. Look at how beautiful that one is, too. Oh, it's just I love how you have it. It's, it feels transparent. And I'm sure you get this all the time. But you know what? It's successful. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. Oh, and I like this meetup. So is this what you use now is meetup to get together with people? Is that? Well, I saw that you had a couple things with this meetup thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, some some. Uh, Yes, some of the time. It, it doesn't work for everything is the bottom line. But, uh, you know, we've been we've been using Meetup as a sort of a way to have a platform to show photos, to get people together and to register people for as long as there's been a Meetup. And there are maybe 2,100 people in the, in the Meetup that we started. Well, I see the actual number is 2,288. 22, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I saw so. that. I go, that's really cool. So when people, when you take this way, when you have people that do workshops, they, they kind of still can connect. Is that what, is that what that is about then? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Oh, that's perfect. So fact, they don't just... I have one workshop I did like two or three years ago. They're still going back and forth and showing each other images. Oh, I love that. I love that. And see, here's, here's the, you know, the, 
multiple, you know, you've got, you've got all this stuff to look at. This is one of the things that I wanted to tell everybody. I, oh, oh this is where I was seeing your printing. Is, is your book, is that part of your book right there, Harold? This one? Yeah, this is one of the limited edition artists. Oh, love it. Look at these sold out. Those are beautiful. Just beautiful. And, you know, that's why I'm like, there's so much. He, You are so busy, and here's your blog, and you write, and everything. So it's like, don't tell me you don't have time for photography. <laughs> we go to Harold Davis's website, then you can tell me. Well, you know, in, in, in fairness, it's my <laughs> vocation as well as my avocation. Would you mind scrolling down the blog sure. a little, showing them the sidebar? So those are many oh. of my, my photography books there as you go. Oh, okay, uh, yes. <laughs> Excuse me. And you can keep going. If you click through, mostly those are linked to Amazon. Mm. I wonder if this is the book that um, Tony liked. Yeah, probably. It's the one I did that's most about HDR. It's an, an AM photo book. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. So, and then look, here's all your other books down in here. So if you guys want to purchase his books, definitely go in there and check it all out. Um, just... <laughs> this is just you're so so awesome i just i like i said i was on here for a while and i really really enjoyed your um you have your artist statements amazing um you guys got it it's it's great it tells you all about how you your art and people will be inspired with that for sure good yeah it's just oh what's lab now does that mean you're working in lab i was just curious about that i wanted to ask you about that Yes, in fact, uh, and, and I, again, I have a Linda LinkedIn course, which is all about how to work in LAB. And again, you can oh. sign up for free and get <laughs> and go and go look at it. Um, so these are all examples of LAB color manipulations of one sort or other. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Wow, I can't believe it. So we're to the end of the show, you guys. Oh, no, not already. I know. I'm telling you, man, it goes by so fast. Oh my gosh, it's just been such a blast. And I can't, there's so much more to dive into your work and everything, but I, you know, I, I gotta get everybody to your website and then this way they could just have a field day and enjoy all of your beautiful um, work and, and all your tips. Cause you have, you give them all a bunch of tips and everything too. So thank you so much for doing that, Harold. I mean, you really do. I could tell that you're very passionate yet, you you know, to teach people too. So that's awesome. Well, I, I truly love teaching people and you know, there's no point in doing anything halfway. And you don't, I can tell. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> no half, hey. <laughs> I don't know what I can say that. I mean, you're A-S-S-R-E, no, I don't even know if I can cuss on, on, uh, on YouTube, but <laughs> you are, you do not mess around. <laughs> All right, you guys. Well, it is a sad time. I always get sad about this. And I just I just really appreciate all your information. And remember, you guys, if you have questions or anything after that, or if I miss something, let me know. And and I'll try to get in touch with Harold if unless I can answer it myself. Let's see. Um, great show. Thank you, Harold. Janice A D. You're welcome, Pat. And and Tony says, hi, Janice Harold's has been a great show my favorite harold book is the black and white hdr that's his favorite book that he's he's had with you so thank you for letting me know all right okay well we're gonna get rolling i have the show in two more weeks it's just with little old me and it's uh, july 25th and i want you to remember that your thousand words makes a difference have a good evening, day, afternoon. Thanks, Harold. Thank Bye. you, Janice. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>